Good morning, students. It is indeed morning. It's about 7, 10 a.m. on Sunday, September 18th, 2022. If you saw my last video, it will not surprise you that I'm going to focus on the synergetics constant. What is synergetics? This time I'm talking about Bucky Fuller's, Buckminster Fuller's philosophy which is kind of physics, but kind of metaphysics. And if you're into philosophy, you know that metaphysics, whatever it means, is not that high reputation anymore. We spent, in the in the eyes of today, we spent too much, wasted too much time with metaphysics. It's a dead end. It doesn't go anywhere. Whereas science gets you to the moon. Maybe Mars. Those kind of thoughts permeate the culture. Now, Fuller, Buckminster Fuller, when I say Fuller, uh, had an interesting way of assisting metaphysics in having meaning and making a comeback, you could say, which I would, I would say accounts for partly why synergetics is shunned by, say, philosophers who don't want uh, metaphysics as a word to make any kind of comeback. He associated the word metaphysics with ephemeralization, as we become more aware of the principles, the generalized principles, I'm using his language, around some phenomenon, we, um, we get to do more with less. The more our comprehension goes up, the less we waste, and the more we can get what we want it done with fewer... Um, overbuilds, like we can be as efficient as nature is if we really get it. That's the goal, right? And we fall short. Our technology, in Fuller's way of thinking, human technology is the lagging technology and nature has, um, it's like we're playing inside of a bubble that has a much higher IQ than we do. So we're, we're at the low end of the totem pole in terms of, I'm not, you can visualize higher IQ, IQ however you want. <clears throat> it's not necessarily a claim that um, we're being assisted or that there's ETs managing us or something. Like you can dive off into any number of myths, stories, paranoias, you name it. Uh, when someone talks about smarter than humans, that gets humans riled up, you know, some of them, so they don't want to hear about it. Or they assume you mean a moon base on the dark side of the moon or something, which I don't. Like, I'm not trying to be specific. I am trying to say that people don't like synergetics a lot. And a lot of people I find inside the synergetics fold. Like, I will call them sheep just for the fun of this particular video. So the, the, the synergetic sheep, a lot of them don't even know there's the wolves out there. They're just bleeding away, and they're pretty content. They're like, why don't we use less XYZ? Why don't we use more 60-degree angles? And I'm all with them because I'm a sheep too. I'm one of the sheep in a way. But I'm aware of the wolves uh, that uh, would like to uh, have us for lunch and so on. I think the synergetics constant has been a stumbling block towards accepting synergetics because even those who kind of like the stuff and would like to teach it if they could don't quite get this or that and they can't picture themselves like in front of a classroom or whatever in like a Reed College or Earlham College trying to hold forth when some student, well, what about this on page whatever? Is that a typo? What's this? What's the synergetics constant, right? And you might go to Amy Edmondson's book called A Fuller Explanation, which came out about 10 years after synergetics itself, about five years after Fuller passed away. And that's, you know, been a very illuminating uh, sort of primer or on-ramp for a lot of people. I got to mention, a lot of people discover synergetics in prison because there's nothing else to do. There's nothing. Why don't we tackle something amazing in the library that's hard to read, that's clearly going to take a lot of my time because I'm here for a while. 
So that's when you get in the mindset to tackle synergetic sometimes. I like to compare it to the book Infinite Jest, which I haven't read. Okay, I've started to read it, I've dabbled in it, and I've disconnected. I found it amazed me, though. And so now I go through the secondary literature and the YouTubes, and I hear them talk about Infinite Jest. And that's like, okay, I can see a lot of people follow synergetics through the secondary literature, but then there isn't that much of it, and you run out pretty quick. So I aim to be another one of those commentators or informed voices that has inf information about this material so that you might even be comfortable enough to, to teach it yourself, because I do fill in the blanks a lot. Like, what is the synergetics constant? And here's the thing. Like, we have a huge, a bazillion, gazillion, unmeasurable investment and in calculable in this so-called XYZ coordinate system. All the tools, all this engineering, everything, our, our, our practices on this. So when we hear the sheep bleeding that we must not use XYZ or XYZ is for losers or something like this, it sounds so helplessly hopeless. It sounds like coming to the Grand Canyon and shouting that uh, it should go away or something. It's like XYZ is a phenomenon of nature, the rectilinear nature of the human thought pattern, the way we think in right angles is very, very, very ingrained. I just want to establish that. It's the orthodoxy is called that for a reason, the orthogonal orthodoxy. And it's not used to having itself critiqued. People don't usually, mathematicians especially, come in, some do, by the way. There's philosophical precedent for being critical of XYZ or, you know, the way things are growing or gro going or growing with regards to geometry. I showed you that Darcy Thompson letter to Alfred North Whitehead, but then he's on the obscure margins in some ways too. He was, he was questioning our concept of dimension and space being three-dimensional Cantor, you know, of, of Cantor dust fame, was a critique of our concept of dimension. People don't read that material as much, I've discovered. You know, there's a lot of these mathematicians write a lot of stuff that it gets filtered out unless you go back to primary sources, which you're always free to do and I encourage. Anyway, in the case of Fuller, my, uh, my goal is to show that the, the research he was doing and the mathematics he was pursuing is very straightforward in enough ways to just merit ongoing, mainstream, you could say, research. It's like it's, it's interesting and important enough to be taught and to reach to that bar, you don't have to be some kind of vengeful army or some kind of like vast takeover, hostile takeover. And we don't have to push XYZ out and we don't have to like seize the limelight for ourselves. See, that's the thing. The, the sheep often imagine some great victory to be had where there's the great generals will uh, win the war for them or something like this. And whereas Fuller was more on the defensive, like trying to get his name in as many phone books as possible, just so people would get name recognition sometimes. Like there was no internet, there, he didn't have billboards. He wanted to be famous. He wanted people to know who he was around the world and he went around the world. But it was partly because he was connecting dots, knowing that when people came to study his life, they would encounter this synergetics, this philosophy, and this way of talking about um, vectors. I was talking about vectors last time myself, Clifford algebra like that. But when Buc when Bucky like splays two vectors apart, like in making an angle, like on a clock hands with his finger, you could think of okay. First of all, think of our culture as a ninety degree based in a lot of ways. But if we had to pick another angle for those two vectors that was prominent in our thinking, 
60, right? 90 and 60 are the two that really suggest themselves. And what have we not explored in 60 world as much? And where can we take it and what does it look like? And 60 includes 120, 60 includes hexagons, 60 includes all that kind of stuff. So the question is, how do we multiply these two vectors, A times B? And in the typical rectilinear world, those are the two sides of a parallelogram. Actually, I could say stronger. Those are two sides of a rectangle, A and B. And A times B, then, is the area of, what, a rectangle. So you really implicitly have to add two more edges to the picture to get two sides of a rectangle, A and B, uh, to form a rectangle, you kind of have to slide A over and make a mirror of it to the right or left or whatever we're doing. It's like, there's a lot of ways to show this, but you basically end up with a rectangle with two length A's and two length B's, and that's the area. And this thing we do with volume is pretty much the same, except we take another stick, C, on a cube now, or actually on a, on a quad, quadril, uh, parallel a pipede, right? A quadrilateral with all angles 90 degrees, blah, blah. We take us a, a third edge and we stand it up straight. We've already got the right angle we had before, and you know the score. We multiply means we multiply those three numbers together. We get a number, A times B times C, and then we depict it to ourselves as a brick, right? And we need two of every edge. We need six. Actually, we need a top and a bottom as well. So we end up with 12 edges, right? Four on top, four on the bottom, four connecting, top to bottom. And our volume is clearly all right angle shaped. Now that we don't think of as strongly as we could as one way to do it. Not the way, but one way. Let's go to 60 degrees. And let's do the same thing as far as A and B, except we don't bother to even create a parallelogram. We don't say the area. There's a, a simpler thing anyone would think of, you'd think, as a way to get area, which is just connect A to B direct across the top. In other words, you have a six. Now, you could do this with 90 degrees, too. But we're going to do it with 60 degrees. We're going to take A and B at 60 degrees to each other, and just close the lid, we call it. You take that A and B and connect the two, and there's a triangle there. And you can measure the area of that triangle, and it turns out to be, if you use what are called ETUs. Now here, I'm borrowing from a gentleman in Australia for vocabulary, and he's discovered and proved all this stuff to him, his own satisfaction, and I don't believe in any way connected to synergetics. Like, he's an independent researcher uh, he's into making um, he's into making uh, water paints so I start with him when I teach this stuff and a lot of times like I'll do it online like I've done it here or I'll do it in front of a group or whatever group online maybe and you could do it too start with the uh, ETU presentation and show how this works for two vectors at 60 degrees. And then when you add your third vector, not at 90 degrees, but again, to make the corner of a regular tetrahedron, except it's not really regular. You've got that corner, but A, B, and C can be any length. The three pencils, their erasers are all in the same place. And you've got these 60 degree angles between any two of them. But you stretch the pencil as far as you want, length A, length B, length C, but what's our cartoon of volume now? Not area, but volume. What's the same? You go A times B times C, you get a number. But what is that number? How do you show it to yourself as a volume? You don't build a whole parallel or anyway, you've already shot your chance at parallel because you started with a 60-60-60 corner, but you just close the lid again like you did with the one angle. I mean, this is like one tip of a polyhedron. Before you had one angle of a polygon, 
You take A, B, and C, you multiply them together by closing the lid, and there's your tetrahedron. And instead, again, of unit cubes, you use unit 60-degree, all 60-degree angled tetrahedrons of edges 1, call that volume 1, and you find out the number of those, like fill them with water, pour them into this thing you've just created, A times B times C, that's the number of tetrahedrons that of water that will fill the bigger one. Like the unit tetrahedrons will fill this bigger guy uh, A times B times C times. So it's as simple in terms of the math as X, Y, Z. And it's as, you know, it's as easy to draw. Closing the lid is a lot fewer lines. That's three lines connecting the three points, at your three endpoints to make a final fourth triangle. Call that forming the volume, A, B, C. That's as graphically and mentally simple, really, as building this whole parallelogram kind of construct and calling that the volume. You know, if you put the 90-90-90 corner down kind of on a table so it's you just see it as uh, X, Y, and Z kind of. And then you see that cartoon for making volume, and then you see how it could be done with 60-degree uh, angles, and it's not that different, right? It's okay. So you see the attraction of the 60-degree way of doing things. In synergetics and then you want to know how can I go back and forth between them like what if I'm working in XYZ but just occasionally I want to jump over and think of this in terms of tetrahedrons and synergetics and unit tetrahedrons and all that what do I do how do I what in a practical sense and this is where Fuller came up with a practical answer I don't think there is just one one correct way that you could Take two independent coordinate systems, we'll call them that, skeletons. You've got two distinct skeletons, the XYZ of all cubes and the IVM of all tetrahedrons and octahedrons, twice as many tetrahedrons. This is something we get from Escher's flatworms, right? Take that scaffolding and the XYZ scaffolding, what's the one right way to size them vis-a-vis -vis each other? And I think you have choices. But what Fuller did is pretty obvious when you think of it. He sized the edges of his tetrahedron to be twice those of the XYZ cube, partly because that brings them within about 6% of the same volume. In other words, the cube is a little bit bigger Think of a unit sphere now. Think of a unit radius sphere of radius r. We're going to use a variable name we often use for radius r. And think of the diameter of said sphere as being d. So a picture of tetrahedron of edges d immediately adjacent a cube of edges r. d and r. And think over on the d side, that tetrahedron, that's what we think of d to the third power. Let's think of D with a little 3 in the upper right, like exponential notation. And that's a little disturbing because we're not used to thinking of a tetrahedron directly in connection with third power quite like this. It's like we're starting to see a little bit of a, a, a it's like this is starting to be a little alien. It's a branch. In fact, all that we've been doing with multiplying to get area and volume as triangles and tetrahedrons is a branch. It's a branch. It's like, or I won't, you could say fork, but let's just call it a branch. And I'm using Git language, uh, language of version control. So you want to go down this route. Let's explore it more. But what's the synergetics constant? Well, we're almost there, and I'm almost done. Once you've got this tetrahedron that's if within six percent of the volume of the cube, it's not quite. It's not the same volume. But you want them related by basically by edges. You want a nice 2 for the tetrahedron, which you could call D, D for diameter. So if you pack four spheres together, identical spheres, in terms of diameter, well, their centers are the four corners of our reference tetrahedron. The edges are D in length. And now you look over at the cube, and it's got its XYZ role to play with. And we'll just say, for synchronization, that its edges are R, and the water pouring situation, you could see it that way. 
is going to be such that if you pour a full cube of water into that tetrahedron next to it of edges D, there'll be a little bit more water, 0 0.06066, whatever, right? So the synergetics constant, you work it out mathematically, but it has to do with the denominator, the unit in each case being slightly different. So if I give you a giant swimming pool of water, and I say, how many tetrahedrons of water is that? If you're looking at tetrahedron, the volume is a little bit less than your XYZ cube, then the answer you come up with is going to be different, right? It's going to be a little bit more in terms of tetrahedrons. It takes more tetrahedrons than it does cubes of water to fill that swimming pool. So then the question is, how much more? And that's the synergetics constant, which you can get from the, um, I always use the cube of face diagonals two, which is also our diameter and volume three. And if you do the computations that in X, Y, Z, that cube would have edges square root of two, which is bigger than one. So I'm talking about a bigger than the usual cube, bigger than the unit cube. It has volume three in synergetics, but in volume, it has volume square root of two to the third power in X, Y, Z. So it's like you have two dollars, like I like to say, the American dollar and the Canadian dollar. And by American, I use the manifest destiny tense, meaning we call, call the whole world America. And finally, I think they might settle down, right? It's their responsibility now. And I think, you know, the just wanton damage of, of infrastructure and human beings, uh, I lay at the door of America, right? Because it's all America. But it's all everything. It's all, it's our promised land, right? The globe is our one country. And you could say that's globalism, but really you got to think globally to act intelligently locally. In my view, a smart nationalist who wants to keep things going well for nation states has to think how to how to basically rig that. Like, how do you work at the global level and get enough cooperation to keep a nation state thing going, right? A believable one. Because right now it's like flickering at the edge of believability. And this is another reason people are kind of wolving around synergetics, right? Because its author wasn't afraid to say things about the precariousness of our older ways of thinking, the nation states and stuff. So he, he was zoomed in on futurism all the time as a science fiction writer. He was always looking to the future and anticipating and predicting that human affairs would get too intertwined to keep it up with our, like, earlier ways of thinking and talking. It just wasn't going to work out for us to stick to that too strongly. And he saw his writings as being our ticket out of this problem to some degree because he's cultivated this awareness. And what I'm saying is, as we learn the synergetics constant and open our door to synergetics, it's not our escape pod. It's not our triumphant conquering vehicle it's our fork or branch within our own culture to create subcultures that are more upbeat about the future they have a sort of better picture of where we're going more optimistic you could say but i don't think fuller was an optimist because he was somewhat pessimistic that even if he was right with his synergetics that people would be able to get out of their specialized worlds enough to read something so weird. Like I like to say, I like to say it's like infinite jest. Think of it as a work in the humanities, like Finnegan's Wake or something. Read it because it's hard English. It's tough prose, not because you want to be a mathematician. It's not your path to being a mathematician. It is, in a way. I mean, you can use it to start your career into geometry, but you still have a lot to learn in terms of math notation, especially, right? Because Fuller doesn't use a lot of it. That was part of his point. I don't want to alienate 
all the people that could get into this if only they spoke math. I'm not going to use a lot of cryptic symbols. And so you get a lot of people reading it who say, this is awful, this is terrible, but what other book have they ever tackled that tried so hard to just give pure geometric like visions and stuff in words, right? And diagrams and pictures. But like Fuller wants pros to do this work so that we can think in synergetics. It's not a matter of sitting down and doing synergetics like we would do addition and multiplication. We can actually think in this language. So yeah, it has to be unfurled and spread out and so we can see it kind of being used. You don't teach a language with a slim little book. Maybe C you do. But if you're talking about a human language, you need something fairly thick, right? Something big enough to be like a planet, connects around to itself, has its own stability. So by rehabilitating Fuller and bringing him up from sort of vaguely charlatanical bogus guy, we want to say pretty serious philosopher where people couldn't get over the hump with him a lot and found his writing too difficult because they just never had the time to get it cleared up. What is the synergetics constant, for example? And I think, I hope, I've given the answer to you. You've seen the tetrahedron and cube side by side, edges D, edges R, respectively. I think, keep that in mind, and the fact that there is a ratio there between those two volumes, and you won't get thrown off. Let's just keep to that, and you'll see that synergetics is making enough sense to merit mainstream treatment and therefore Bucky with all of his serious questions about nationalism and so on should be part of the conversation more. Bucky, Bucky Fuller, he liked, he didn't want to be a threatening character. And like a dictator, he's not trying to be a Stalin. So I think reading about him and studying his life, in fact, will open you to a huge number of critical people in history. And that can only be to your service. You will understand how to go forward with your own story and the story of civilization more co coherently. It's kind of like weaving a tapestry. You don't just, you can, you can sort of start over, but so much easier to build on who and what has come before. Really avail yourself of your heritage. That's what I'm suggesting, bottom line. All right, so I hope that was of interest, and uh, we'll be talking. We'll be talking.